Kenyans anxious for news on the next president two days after a tight vote. And eight policemen killed in Sierra Leone's protests. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Cole. Two days after Kenya's general election, officials are yet to announce who is leading the presidential race in East Africa's regional powerhouse. Confused citizens were seen struggling to make sense of the divergent tallies from the media in a nail-biting closing race. Now, meanwhile, some citizens were worried uh, that the media's different tallies could inflame claims of rigging which had sparked violence in past elections. Many have urged fellow citizens to wait for the official results. Now, the outgoing president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has reached his two-term limit and has endorsed veteran opposition leader and former political prisoner Raila Odinga for president after failing, uh, falling out with Ruto after the last election. Kenyan election authorities have proceeded with telling cautiously wary of the mistakes that caused the Supreme Court to nullify the results the last time and ordered a rerun. Re well, joining us to discuss this is Jim India. He's a policy and research officer, and of course, he's an analyst. And also joining us is Agogobo, who is a foreign affairs analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with you, Jim. Give us, uh, paint a picture uh, to us of what's happening right now in Kenya. Uh, I mean, I know that everybody's waiting. Some are seated by the air, on the edge of their seats, waiting to hear uh, the results. But it's taken uh, two days after the elections, and we're yet to get, you know, a final result. Some say it's too close to call, but you're the man who's on ground. Give us an idea of what's happening. All right. Thank you very much, Um Right now... What we have is uh, uh, the Independent Electoral and Boundary Commission in Kenya is doing the tallying uh, because what we had in the country was the result would be done at the polling station and then they would be electronically transmitted to uh, the National Tallying Center where the Independent Electoral and Boundary Commission sits. So right now, the Independent Electoral and Boundary Commission has received all the... Uh, different results from all the 290 constituencies in Kenya, and they're doing verification of those results, and the verification is being done alongside party agents um, and international and local observers to just ensure that the results that we have at the National Tallying Center are the same as what was announced at the polling stations. Now, once that verification is done, the chairman of the Electoral Commission will then go ahead and announce the result of that particular constituency. So as we speak right now, they've announced about 30 or so constituencies, um, and we have about 260 more constituencies to go. By law, the, the body has seven days to announce the results. So they have said they are on track. They have until Tuesday next week. In 2017, we did not get a result until four days later. So by any signs, we are actually the, or a good sign. But of course, a lot of Kenyans are anxious, as you said, because the media had started doing the tally before the commission did. And different stations had different results because they were tallying from different polling stations. So obviously, they're going to have different results. Um, but as we speak, the media has stopped doing the tallying, and they are all now waiting for the commission to do this tally. Let's talk about how this election has um, been largely about economic class, uh, the hustlers versus, you know, the dynasties. With, you know, we, I also know that ethnicity is also sprinkled around it. But uh, let's let's dive into that. Um, so the two main contenders, which is you have William Ruto on one side, who has been pushing for the hustler narrative or what we call the bottom-up economic approach. Um, essentially, he's saying that 
majority of Kenyans are at the bottom of the economic pyramid and a lot of government investment needs to go to the bottom of the economic pyramid so that you then bring those who are at the bottom, you bring them up. So bottoms up economic and he's really pushing. Um, his message resonates a lot with the hustlers. So that is those who drive motorcycles, those who sell vegetables, the low income earners um, in the country. And it has pitted them against the wealthy and the rich who are called the diabetes. Um, and on the other side, you have Raila Odinga, who is the son of former, the first vice president of the Republic of Kenya, uh, Jaramongi Ging Odinga. Um, he is more or less calling for social protection programs. He is saying that uh, because, again, majority of Kenyans are poor, the government needs to invest a lot more money into them. But he's asking that instead government should give at least 6,000 to 2 million poor families every month to cushion them against poverty, against hunger. Um, and to give them a, the, the chance to, you know, sustain themselves is also pushing for free education from primary school all the way to university. He's pushing for free healthcare and access to healthcare for all Kenyans. So you have these two um, extremists on one side saying we need to inject money and allow people to make money on their own. But on the other side, you have someone saying we need a social protection plan that actually ensures that first they have money and then we will then create more jobs. But of course, both of them are trying to appeal to the youth who are the largest majority, who are the largest uh, constituency in Kenya, uh, just like any other African country. Unfortunately, young people did not register so well in this election. We only had about 39% of the registered voters being young people. Our voter turnout of the 22 million registered voters, only 14 million turned up to vote. So that's about 65% voter turnout. But again, many people do not turn up to vote for this election because they do not see how it affects their life. They do not see how whichever choice, whether it's Raila Ding or William Ruto, how that will impact the quality of their life. Interesting. Um, Agola, let me come to you. Let's do some history, 60-second uh, history class here. Let's do a brief comparison as to what's happening in 2022 as opposed to what's happened over the years. And let's see if there are any sheer differences um, you know, compared to what's um, going on today. All right. Um, let, me, let me say Ashanti Sana. <laughs> all right. So I, I, I think that when you compare and you contrast all that happened in previous elections in Kenya, you know, what, what will come to your mind will be from 1992. So you had um, Arab Moy, then uh, after Arab Moy, you had uh, Moy Kibaki. And, and the reason why the entire continent uh, began to take notice of the Kenya election was because of uh, the unfortunate violence that happened in the aftermath of the 2007 election. Uh, and then you remember what happened with the constitutional reform. Uh, I'm sure Jim can talk a lot about that and how you had elections uh, happen again in 2013. Incidentally, I was in Kenya for the elections in uh, 2013, where it was between Uhuru Kenyatta and um, Y and um, Raila Odinga also. To, I also got to interview Raila Odinga also to uh, during that election. And it's interesting because you have the eyes of the entire international media thinking that um, what forbid the, the, the violence that there in 2007, if it could have happened again in 2013, whether lessons had been learned. But Thankfully, um, the 2013 election was peaceful, and um, you had Uhuru emerge as the, as the president of uh, Kenya. Uh, 2017 um, also took a lot peaceful compared to what happened in 2007. So what we've seen as the elections in Kenya has happened, um, as it should happen, is the eyes of the continent or the rest of the world moved away from, um, like, like Jim said, has moved away from the fear of violence happening to what the everyday ordinary Kenyan stands to benefit uh, from whoever emerges as um, the winner of the, election, of the election in Kenya, which of course is where we all hope, and what we hope should be the legacy of um, the democratic process in Kenya, whether it's in Kenya, whether it's in Ghana, whether it's in South Africa, or even Nigeria, the continent wants a free, fair, great election. We want to get to a point just like um, when I did cover the elections in Ghana where the election observer uh, mission then said that, look, we want a time to happen where the international community will not send observer missions from Europe, or from the Americas, or from uh, the Commonwealth to observe elections because they believe that the local election election body conducting elections do, does not need outside supervision or a stamp of um, 
uh, of credibility that these elections were free and fair based on what we observe. Rather, we can look at our, us as Africans and say, these elections have met not just our local standards, original standards, but um, global standards of how elections should be held. So uh, I think um, like the rest of us who are bored now with having to wait until the election results are finally out, we'll keep our fingers crossed. But by and large, I think the legacy of the elections in Kenya look positive in terms of what the conduct uh, has been, you know, compared to um, what we saw in 2007. Uh, in the years before that. Let's go into the politics of it all. Um, it's very intriguing for those of us who are looking from the outside in that um, uh, a Kenyatta is supporting a Raila Odinga as opposed to a Ruto who uh, is his, uh, you know, his number two. Um, let's look at the politics there. How do you explain that to the average person? <laughs> I, I think that um, it's a question Interestingly, you know, we also have maybe a Nigerian experience. I was talking to a politician a couple of days back, and I was trying to chide him that, look, if you have a political party, and then you move from one party to the other party, does that in any way mean that you're a credible politician we can trust? And he said, no. The party is just a vehicle for the politician. They're all the same. So many African democracies are functioning at that level. You can count on your fingertips the African democracies that have the candidates that really believe in their party policy or their party's agenda. They're basically looking for a very good team, which is why you can explain, you can imagine that um, in 92, you had uh, William Ruto back in Uhuru uh, Kenyatta, and then afterwards, uh, he decided to run for office, and, and he said, no, he's not going to come back. He can't come to me. And they were upset with him. Even Kibaki, he's... Um, his uh, godfather, and then he ran for the election, obviously opposed to Uru Kenyatta. But interestingly, I remember when they ran in 2013, you know, uh, both of them on the same ticket. I spoke with the African Union head of political affairs, and I said, look, people are concerned that you have William Ruto and Uru Kenyatta who are wanted for war crime, had charges to answer. If you have them win the election, how will the African Union have uh, a president and a deputy president having to answer uh, war crimes charges. And she said, no, let that time come. We'll cross the bridge when it happens. In the election, it is the popular niche of Kenyans that they best represent their interest. Because the, the rest is history. Those charges were eventually dropped. And I want to tell you, I'm sure that you know that Uhuru and William Ruto were on the same team because it was politically expedient for them at that time. When they had used their usefulness one for the other, I'm sure Ruth realizes it's time for him to be prolonged. So it maybe explains uh, why you had them, I guess, going on the same ticket, and yet you would not have uh, to get gain the support of uh, the going president uh, Kenyatta. Interesting. Let, let me let me come back to Jim. Jim, um, let's talk about how crucial this particular election is to the people of Kenya. And of course, sir, I'm wondering, what sorts of reforms are Kenyans looking towards, I mean, and looking forward to, especially uh, after an Uhuru Kenyatta is leaving office? What are the things that they're looking out for? And, and how does that determine how they vote? Um, so uh, one of the, the reasons why this particular election is very important is the transition period. We live in, you know, Uhuru Kenyatta has these two terms, and he is... Uh, handing over power, he's agreed to the and over power. So it's transitions. And like many transitions, they need to be managed with well. um, Because we are coming from a president who invested heavily in the infrastructure of this country, invested heavily in um, like, uh, connecting um, last mile electric connection, invested a lot in education and healthcare. And those investments came at a price. They came at a very huge public debt we have borrowed. When Uhuru Kenyatta came into office in, in 2013, our debt was at about $2 trillion. When he's moving with office, our debt is close to $9 trillion. Trillions. So he's leaving us with a huge debt. And the next administration needs to come in and figure out how do we pay off the debt that we owe the international community. And also number two, Uhuru Kenyatta is leaving office um, when a huge population is unemployed. Again, that's a story that is very common across many African countries. 
but we need to figure out how do we get, uh, get employment for the majority of our population. Those are some of the two priorities in this, in this particular election. How do we pay our debt and how do we get our young people employed? Beyond that, we also have um, a huge population that's now educated, but we do not have enough capacity um, in our higher institutions of higher learning. Just before he left office, he gave university data to about 20 different universities because we're trying to expand that infrastructure to allow more young people to go to higher education. So this particular uh, election is put into Kenyans because of that. It's the economy is what is on the ballot. The economy is what we are looking for. Both candidates had a very valid plans and valid manifestos to deal with the economy and the issues that I'm raising. Let's talk about the issue of corruption. Just like Kagogo mentioned, the, I mean, it's, it's, it's corruption is an issue where it's, is an issue discussed everywhere in the world, but then Africa seems to have more of those conversations. Uh, what would you say about the level of corruption in Kenya, and um, what would a leader need to do to stem that tide, if there be any? Um, so again, both of the candidates who, the leading candidates on the ballot, I mean, we have four presidential candidates, but who are the leading candidates, Raylo Dinga and um, William Ruto. So Raylo Dinga has come out to be a very strong anti-corruption crusader, um, he chose a woman deputy president, uh, Martha Karua, who has a long history of uh, standing on the right side of justice. And in fact, when Martha Karua was appointed deputy president, or running mate to Raila Odinga, she's not just going to be a deputy president, she's also going to be the minister of justice and constitutional affairs. And one of the, the reasons why that became very popular is because they were seen as anti-corruption crusaders. They have for a long time being against corruption. And on the other side, you have William Bruto and his deputy and his running mate. During the electoral process, the running mate was actually indicted for corruption um, in a court of law. Um, and so they have been seen as not being um, anti-corruption, but they have made it very clear in their manifesto that if anyone is found capable of corruption, then you know they will be prosecuted. Part of what needs to be done, and both parties have said it, is the judiciary needs to be independent. Now, the only way to get judiciary to be dependent is to have a fund that is controlled by judiciary and is not controlled by the executive. And so right now, there's been the establishment of the judiciary fund, which comes directly from the exchequer and is not controlled by either parliament or, um, or the executive. That way, the judiciary can actually make very fair judgments without the fear that their funds would be blocked either from the executive or from the legislature. But the second thing that needs to be done is that other institutions, you know, the institutions like the police, we have an ethics and anti-corruption commission, we have a directorate of criminal investigations. All these institutions now need to coordinate their efforts better um, to ensure that uh, we are stopping any changes in spending of public resources. And the last thing that needs to happen is that even the citizens needs to be a lot more vigilant in keeping the public officials who have just been elected accountable so that our involvement in the electoral process does not end at the ballot. It does not end at voting, but it continues even after that, that we continuously participate in the budget making process and keep our leaders accountable to track if the things that they have said they will do, they are actually doing. Interesting. Back to you, Agogo. Let's talk about some of the um, reforms that, uh, the electoral reforms that Kenya has in place that maybe countries like us who call ourselves the big brother of Africa can learn from. Don't forget, our elections are just around the corner. We're in campaign season. I, 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 I understand that prisoners and people in diaspora can vote in Kenya, and they actually make up uh, about three to four million in total, according to authorities of the, you know, the voting population. What, are, what are, are the other things that you think Kenya is doing in terms of its electoral process that we could learn from? Excellent. I, I think it's a brilliant uh, point about how the Kenyan electoral process has also provided lessons for the rest of the African uh, continent. But I'm not too sure if you have, we have to wait seven days uh, or four days before the election results come out in Nigeria. Uh, how we're going to go through that. So I would have to say I admire their patience in 
having to wait for uh, the results to be out uh, three, four days. I mean, if you have that happening in Nigeria, there will be a pandemonium. Um, so even with the um, plethora of fake news and all of that misinformation going on, I know they're having a difficult time having to control the narrative um, because of how the news is coming up. So, uh, the officials, uh, even the, um, the chair of the, I, of the Electoral and Bank Commission, you know, talk about how difficult it was controlling the news coming in from those sources. So I, I think it's a problem we're going to have to face also too, because the Kenyans did get very early on the technology uh, with the electronic transmission of result. I think by 2013, it was even used, even before we began to use the card reader and that process, which we now have in Nigeria with the viewing portal. Mm. When we spoke with INEC about, uh, that's the Nigeria Electoral Commission, about how uh, moving the narrative forward, so you can have people uh, in groups or classes get involved in the election. They say that, um, you know, how difficult it was for us to even get this current electoral law passed. So, 2023 general elections be done, and then the next uh, huddle will be to see how to get diaspora voting involved. Uh, it will be see to see how to get those who are. Uh, in prisons, for example, get to vote those who are so-called in quote essential duties and get out of the process because it's a huge chunk of the numbers of people who don't get to vote on election day in Nigeria. So I think that's something we have to learn very quickly uh, from also too. Uh, I think another thing I saw with, with the way the election act was going was, was going on in Kenya is um, so, so we're doing the card reader thing. So if you don't have a card reader, for example, in Nigeria can vote, but I, I saw that they could vote with, um, with uh, identification, like ID cards and all that. I don't know if Jim will confirm that, but here you can't vote with ID cards. You'd have to vote with the card uh, with the PVC. So it's a question about what we've been able to do with our data aggregation. If you have one data, which is key, key to us ever, a lot of people have argued we should be able to use that. Whether you have the PVC, any document you have which has the biometric stored in a central server, which is a government identification document, you should be able to vote with it. So those are things I think we should be able to. Interestingly, in the elections, uh, early 2000, uh, I think even up till now, Nigeria has been able to help um, other West African countries improve the electoral process too. I think what they call ECONEC, which is the economic uh, community of um, election observers. So we sort of provide logistic support and Nigeria leads that team and they're able to share uh, experiences and also resources and best I remember there were elections in Liberia and uh, I think once in Sierra Leone also too and the Gambia. Uh, Nigeria resources we also used to provide. But I think the point Jim makes also where we are too as a nation, uh, what happens after the electoral process? How involved is the electorate after the choice of the candidates in ensuring that what we call in Nigeria the dividends of democracy happens. We don't have to wait for four years or five years and say, okay, we're going to go to the ballot to say whether the person has worked or not worked. We should even bring up scorecard on a regular basis to say, uh, on this parameter, how has this person fared? On this particular policy, how has this person fared? Because if we are able to check this very quickly, it will put the politicians or the candidates who have won the elections check. Make sure that they're able to score themselves in the self assessment, keep themselves out of office even before uh, the date of the election. So, I think that's one very important point, made, uh, which all of us can learn from. Uh, I also think that, um, the, you know, the problem so, uh, Kenya has a Kenya has never suffered a coup d'etat, they, they've got a democratic experience. I sent many East African countries, I think uh, even Tanzania also, to a major list don't have that problem with that. Mm. The problem people have pointed out in the West African region, even in Central Africa also too, the role of the Rex, you know, the blocks which form the African Union, the regional blocks, saying that what have you done for the people to check through the peer review mechanism what is happening in this country? No, not to send observer missions to what electors in the score. This election met local standard. This election met regional standards because the same people are pointed back and thrown stones mm -hmm. at um, the regional bodies' representatives when the coups have happened, saying, 
where were you? Where were you when this first month election and after one to three months you reneged on the electoral promises? Mm -hmm. So I believe those are lessons that we can compare and contrast those with countries like Kenya to see how to make the democratic experience a more wholesome experience rather than what we are going through where people feel that we are not being necessarily represented in the policies or government that they interestingly have elected. Very good. Um, finally, let me come back to you, Jim. Let's talk about peace. Uh, I'm, I'm a peace ambassador, so I'm always looking for peaceful strategies when it comes to the electoral processes. How or what strategies, I think I should ask, what strategies, uh, um, peaceful strategies, has Kenya over the years been able to use or apply that's helped? Because just like we said, we remember 20, 2007 very vividly because it still rever reverberated uh, across the continent. Um, but now Kenya is experiencing a peaceful, hopefully, um, handover to whoever takes over um, after these results are read. And it's, it's been able to also manage information dissemination so far, just like Agogo said, um, in a very patient manner. Um, what are some of those strategies that, again, we could learn from, the rest of the world could learn from? Because it seems like Kenya uh, is, uh, you know, on the up and up. Um, so one of the things that, I mean, changed after 2007 was we got a new constitution. We promulgated a new constitution in 2010. And that constitution did two things. One, it created what we called the National Cohesion and Integration Commission, whose sole mandate is to ensure that throughout, um, throughout the year, throughout you know, the electoral process, we are maintaining peace. So if any politician you know, spews hate speech or is incitement to violence, this commission is mandated to charge them with that offense. It's an offense to actually incite violence, it's an offense to, you know, to hate speech. Um, but the second thing that we also did after well, that commission is we created pathways and opportunities that political disputes could be dealt with in a court of law. So in 2013, Raila Odinga disputed the results of the presidential election. He went to the Supreme Court, he was heard, and the judges ruled against him. And he accepted the results, and we all moved on. In 2017, he again disputed the results of that election. He went to the Supreme Court, he presented his case, and the, 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 that constitutional court ruled in his favor, and we had to do a repeat election. So we have seen from past experiences that actually there are legal means, a legal way of uh, resolving electoral disputes. And now this does not just happen at the presidential level, it happens at the governance race, it happens at the member of parliament race. If you have any issues with the process, you can go to court, present it, and you know it, you will be happy. So I think that particular um, confidence that the Kenyan people have had with the judiciary has actually said there's no point of us fighting because the, 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 the courts are actually passed to do their job. But the last thing that has happened is that the civil society groups have also done an incredible job of uh, preaching peace, of um, doing civic education among especially the young people and saying, hey, we need to live together. We have a country after this election. And so those three sort of strategies, I would say, is part of the reason we are enjoying the things that we have. Even right now, people are saying, if anyone will dispute the results of this election, the Supreme Court is open. Please go and contest at the Supreme Court. Well, good luck to you. Uh, and of course, uh, while you wait for the results, we're hoping that um, the people of Kenya will be pleased, whoever turns out to be their president. Um, Agogo Obo is a foreign affairs analyst, and uh, Jim India is a policy and research officer. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. Thank you. Sante. All right. Sante. Sana. All right. Thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we go to Sierra Leone to find out what's happening. Uh, someone, a few people actually were killed as a result of the protest that took place in Sierra Leone. We'll be having uh, the head of a security agency in the country speak to us after this break.